are talking to John Mack, and welcome. Hi. <laughs> uh, great that you took the time for me. Thank you very much. Um, and um, actually, I found you through your comment on the LRG video, where um, actually this guy from YouTube presented Operation Frog, and that is what we will talk about um, today. Right. And it, it was one of the first programs where you actually would do a surgery on a, <laughs> on a, on a frog. On, or, any, on an animal. On any animal. <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a, a nice review he did. I forget his name, but... Um, it was on a what was it a Commodore 64 he or exactly yes right. exactly you know the original was uh, designed and programmed for a Apple Apple II computer and then uh, it was transported or trans how do you say that uh, converted converted to work on a Commodore and other computers that. You know, um, unfortunately, those couldn't use the same uh, kind of graphics. And so I have to say that the Apple II graphics were a little superior at that time. That was 35 yeah. years ago, right? Yeah, exactly. It's actually interesting because I've read that actually you are um, in the pharmaceutical area actually and you took classes a master of computer communication and computer graphics in 75 right. 76 and i wonder <laughs> how did that happen to be i mean we all know the home computer craze started in like 77 and um real big were home computers in the early 80s well, so uh, yeah so how did that happen that you were um, interested into computers at such an early time? Well, um, you know, I was uh, in the sciences at college uh, studying chemistry and biology, and I wanted to be a biochemist. So uh, obviously the sciences use computers a lot. And um, of course, at that time, there weren't any personal computers when I went to college. So you had to use the university or college computers, you know, work <clears throat> with professors and so on. And then when I went to graduate school at Columbia University, um, there was somebody, uh, one of the professors um, gave a, a little course for anybody who was interested in and how to uh, do computer graphics. Mainly they were just doing you know, driving some kind of a um, a pen across paper and making designs, and you would program it. Uh, and so I found that very interesting. Um, but I didn't, you know, I was always interested in graphics, and so um, I didn't stay in the program to get my PhD in biochemistry, and I left that and. Uh, started doing my own business in um, uh, scientific illustration. I always was interested in illustration and, uh, you know, at one point I wanted to go to school to study that, but um, I just kept on going with my own business and working with the uh, professors at uh, Columbia. And one of my professors there, um, now, now we're getting into the age where there actually was personal computers. Uh, one of my clients said, hey, you know, I'd like you to build a molecular model of hemoglobin. And uh, at that time, computers, you know, these big computers were used to study the structure of proteins. And I really got interested in it after he gave me this job to construct a model, a physical model of hemoglobin. And to do that, you needed to do some calculations. You needed to calculate how to drill holes to hold it up. And I won't get into the details, 
But I asked a friend at Columbia, and we did some time sharing on the IBM 360 computer uh, and the main campus at Columbia. He wrote the program in Fortran, I bet, I believe, <laughs> and uh, would run it for me to show you every possible place where to drill the holes and what the angles had to be, and uh, I could plan the model. But unfortunately, the IBM 360 and the time-sharing computers didn't have real computer graphics. That wasn't part of it. So it's okay to drill, you know, a hole to hold up something. But so you had these rods going through the molecule, through the model. And you had to know if there were other molecules in the way. If you want to put a rod here, well, what's below it? Is it going to hit something? So I needed to see what that looked like. So, uh, you know, I picked, I got the Apple II computer and took the Fortran program that my friend wrote, converted it to basic, and used the Apple graphics. And it was great. I could get a 3D, uh, it's kind of crude, 3D image of the whole uh, hemoglobin, and I can see where the rods were, and I can see if they uh, interfered with other things. So that's how I really got interested in in computer graphics, basically. And uh, of course, being an illustrator, I, for my business, that's the only way. I, reason, the only thing I use computer graphics for. It wasn't really good enough to actually create graphics that were useful for scientific publications because the resolution wasn't high enough. So I didn't use it for my business until much later. Well, that was way before HD. I mean, the Commodore 64 had 320 by 200 <laughs> yeah. pixels, and that's not very very much. Uh, 16 colors. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it's amazing what, you know, with some creativity, what you can do with that. And... Uh, I really am glad that I had the opportunity to work with that kind of, you know, low resolution technology because I got to understand how computer graphics were generated. And uh, later on, we, you mentioned that I was working in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, you know, I got a job uh, heading up a computer based training department at a um, company that did sales training for uh, pharmaceutical sales representatives. So, you know, it was really funny because this was at a time before the sales people had laptop computers. They didn't have them. But I decided that we needed to design programs, you know, for them because they were eventually going to have them. But I decided that we needed to use Macintosh. We needed to, uh, this was when the Mac came out. So now you get much higher resolution, a good graphics machine. And I decided that we needed to have our artists develop uh, the original graphics at the highest possible resolution. Because then you can always dumb it down to whatever resolution they were using on their laptops. And meanwhile, you would be way ahead of the game by having this library of high resolution images that could also be used in uh, other kinds of presentations where you know higher resolution was required. So that that was uh, you know a good experience, and that's how I got really into um, computer graphics, but before the Operation Frog happened before that, before I got into the pharmaceutical industry. So that was a, uh, that actually got me the job when I showed them Operation Frog. <laughs> they liked it so much, they hired me. <laughs> so, um, so it's not kind of like with other people in the industry that well, just learned coding and developed some games for the Commodore 64 or other computers to um, finance a college or to finance studies they make. Um, you actually, you actually did this, did this all before. 
Um, yeah, you know, I was interested in programming, uh, but you know, I, I, I kind of felt I wanted to do maybe more creative things. Uh, I don't know. I, I wish I had studied programming more, but um, you know, there were a lot better programmers than me, especially when we did Operation Frog, because they were all programming in assembly language. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but <laughs> never learned it. But it's still on my bucket list of things to do. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so they were. You know, it was amazing how you could. Uh, you know, just programming, you had to know exactly where to store things in memory. It wasn't just, a, you know, you, you can't leave it up to the computer. You have to you have to code all that and you have to know how, you know, there were there were parts of the Apple II um, memory. I don't know what you call it, but it, that wasn't really accessible to any other kind of programming. And so if you knew where, if you knew how to access that part of memory, you can get a lot more memory and a lot bigger, a lot more complicated programs to run. And that's what they were doing. And that's why I decided to work with them because not only was there graphics, you had, it was animation. The whole thing was animated and, uh, it, and it was because of the way they use memory. And of course the efficiency of programming at, at that level, I guess. So. so how was it at that time? I remember I once interviewed Chuck Paddle, who was the lead designer of Commodore back uh, in the late 70s when he did the PET in 1977. And he said that he got um, raging letters from, from teachers who said that computers are going to replace teachers because you don't need you don't need teachers anymore because computers are replacing them and now we are talking about operation frog which is essentially an education program and um so in the in the end it more supported even the teachers and schools and colleges and so on so it didn't replace anybody no and, right I mean, that was the primary reason. I mean, I forget exactly why we came up with this frog dissection idea, but I remember in biology class uh, in, in high school where they would hand out um, mimeographed sheets of instructions. Do you remember what mimeograph was? I mean, it was talk about low technology. And the... You know, so they were very, very low quality, and it, it was meant to prepare the student to give them instructions for the proper procedure to operate on this frog. Um, and it was terrible. I mean, you know, it's like a user's manual that was very badly written. So I said, you know, this, you know, we can improve that. We can, you know, this program can actually help teachers. Uh, if the students were to use this program beforehand, uh, they would have a lot more fun and it would uh, be a lot better than handing out these mimeograph things. But I didn't really design it to replace the actual dissection of frogs, even though, I don't know, I guess now it's not politically correct to have uh, sacrificed all those frogs for high school students. <laughs> well, at least here in Europe, we never had that. <laughs> so it's it's only um, American thing. We we only saw it in the movies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and how did it actually happen? Did you approach Scholastic and said you have an idea for a education program? Or how did that start, actually? Well, uh I worked with a small company of the programmers who had already, I think, published a couple of uh, games, uh, computer graphic games. Actually, um, this one. Yeah, uh, that's the Scholastic version for the Commodore, right? Exactly. Yes. Oh, you know, I should go and get the. I have. <laughs> I have the box. I have the box for the Apple II one. 
And, <laughs> and that's the disc. Yeah. And still, it's still working. Yeah. You know, you had to turn the disc. You had to turn the disc upside down to get the graph, the the uh, information on the back side. It was recorded too. Exactly. It always <laughs> says a flip disc. Yeah. Flip. <laughs> that was funny. Um, yeah. So what was I saying about? Uh, oh, the company was a small company. Uh, I forget how I met them. I don't. I don't know how I, you know, really met them, but. Uh, they had already done some uh, work maybe with Scholastic already, and they asked me, because of my background, uh, if I could develop some kind of, um, you know, I some kind of a game with them. And uh, I, you know, like I'm trying to remember the sequence of things in my life. But <laughs> uh so I came up with this idea, and it was originally called Defrogger. Defrogger? But yeah. that sounds a bit like the Atari game, <laughs> Frogger. Yeah, but we couldn't use that one. <laughs> yeah, because Atari was first, I guess. Yeah. Right, so uh, we came up with Operation Frog, and uh, so they sold it to a Scholastic. You know, we made a kind of a presentation before them, and, you know, a pitch. I guess, and we started designing it. And you know, actually, I had to learn how to dissect a frog because <laughs> I hadn't done it in years and years and years. So I went to my friends again at Columbia University in the biology department and did a couple of frog dissections. Ooh, <laughs> and took photographs. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I don't think I don't have the photographs anymore. But. Um, I don't think they would be too tasty to show them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So that, that that was and so, you know, I worked with the company and um, tried to do a few other things with them later, but nothing really was as successful as Operation Frog, obviously. Were you aware that is that at this time it was one of the first programs? of its kind or had you no idea what you were doing <laughs> i no i don't know i mean it wasn't you know i we didn't think of it as being a first we thought of it as being you know very creative and yeah maybe something that nobody has done before uh so maybe yeah we were thinking about that but um in the beginning, you know, I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out. You know, uh, what were the was the animation going to be quick enough, or you know, otherwise they would just stop playing the game, and or you know, uh, could we make it challenging? You know, so those are the things that were on my mind, and I also wanted to make it as you know scientifically accurate as possible. So there were. There were three different layers of the frog you had to get through and uh, try to make that as realistic as possible. And, you know, you you can't get to the liver without going through the heart first or something. <laughs> But now here's the game. It started with the frog was already pinned down to the table and the cavity, chest cavity opened up. So you didn't have to do that. That was probably the most disgusting part. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, this um, program started with a really very well done animation, which was quite unique at its time of 84. Yeah, but because they had, I guess, some proprietary code. And like I said, the way they use the memory, their Uh, use of they're not using the you know higher level language which would slow it down and uh so that was pretty efficient yeah and um were you aware that this program came um famous three years after when a student named jennifer Graham decided she she doesn't want to do it on a living frog anymore Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know when I remember when I got aware of that, but it wasn't, it was maybe a couple of years after that, uh, I heard about that. And, uh, it was also featured in, uh, Time Magazine. 
Um, it wasn't on the cover, but <laughs> they did a special on um, educational software, and that was one of them that they featured, Operation Frog. So, yeah, I still have that magazine. I should have brought all this stuff uh, here to show people, but... <laughs> Actually, you have some drawings from back in the day you could share. Yeah, let me see if I can uh, bring that up. Hold on a second. I'm really surprised you remember so much and you kept all the drawings. Uh, well, yeah, how, why did I keep them? I don't know. <laughs> Well, you seem to be a person who likes to keep stuff from the past, which is good. Yeah. Let me see if I can open this, uh, one of the drawings I have. Um, I'll have to turn the screen back on for yeah. you. Exactly. All right, let me just get it up there first. Yeah, so this is, um, you know, one of the pages from the storyboard. I mean, uh, I guess the, all animators, you know, are... Anybody creating a movie, for example, would create something like this, a storyboard. And so I developed this um, way of uh, designing the program. And I'm, you can see it dates back to April of 1984. <laughs> and um, so it was a simple uh, drawing. And there were instructions below. I'm not, you know, I don't know, you know, what all those instructions mean anymore but i think um when i'm talking about accessed from that part there where it says stomach and gullet and so on there was a probe that um would you know if you touch one of the uh if you took out one of the organs and put it in the examination tray and you brought the probe over it it would bring up this screen so if you touch the uh, liver in the examination tray, it would bring up this screen and more information, I think, about, you know, the liver and so on. And so that's what those instructions meant. And um, so there were other instructions that helped um, put the program together and how instruct the uh, animators and uh, programmers how to to to, to um, you know, access all the parts of the program. So, and then um, to, let's see what it looks like when um, uh, it was all done. I got a screenshot. Nice. Uh, I'll show you that. Okay, that's side by side, I see. So, yeah, that's the screenshot. So it's pretty much follows the same thing. This is, you know, the information that's on the backside of the uh, disc when you probed something like the liver or the stomach. There was the examination tray. Uh, let's see if I can get that. So it's kind of an encyclopedia. Yeah. On the back of the disc. Right. Okay. Well, this is a, uh, <laughs> this is a Commodore image. Hold on a second. That's too small. This is a very low resolution image, but. Well, the Commodore 64 didn't have much resolution. So. Yeah. So this is the pro. Well, this is no, these are the tweezers. You would take out the organ. This would be a lung, right? Yep. And then you'd have to find where it should go in the tray, examination tray. And once you got it into the tray in the right place, it would drop in. And you could, I don't know if you used a probe or the magnifying glass, but you had to use the scissors to cut it out first. You had the there was only a couple of places you had to maybe snip on two different places to remove it. I don't remember all that. So it was pretty detailed. You had to cut it out. You had to, 
you know, use the tweezers to remove it and put it in the right place. You had to uh, then, I guess you could use the magnifying glass or the probe to get more information. The magnifying glass was the one that you would press for the more information. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess the probe was used when it was not in the tray or it just gave you some preliminary information. Um, but the game, it wasn't like um, you had to, you know, do it in a hurry. I don't think it, you know, was like, um, uh, it wasn't competitive in that way where you try to you get a higher score if you do it faster. I'm, I don't think it, it had a score. No, it didn't. Uh, it seriously didn't. Yeah. 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 It was, you know, supposed to be for education. Yeah. What I find interesting is um, the scale was actually in inch and in centimeters, which is pretty neat because America is not very <laughs> fond of the metric system. Well, look, I was brought up as a scientist. Scientists in the U.S., they use the metric system. You, you, you knew that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Until they built that telescope, they... Screw that up. <laughs> so, um, how was this whole um, reaction from family and friends when you said you wrote an education program? I mean, I know from my childhood and from other people, education programs were mostly used as excuses for parents to get a computer. And what would you do most of the time? You would play on the computer <laughs> and not run any, any education program. So... Uh, um, how was it? Did your family think that working on an education um, program would be useless? I mean, most people were, I guess, scared of the new thing called home computers. Uh, well, I mean, talking about my family at that point, you know, I was uh, grown up. And so I, you know, my, my mother and father couldn't tell me what to do anymore. <laughs> But uh, they weren't in in charge of my life but uh you know i mostly hung around with people who were really into computers and felt that this was you know the future i mean uh i remember when in graduate school i went out to uh you know i was in new york uh which is well known for you know financial and things like that but not so much you know high technology But I had a chance to go out to Berkeley, uh, University of California at Berkeley, as part of my studies in biochemistry. And uh, over there, I went to Silicon Valley. And, you know, I was amazed that some of the technology people were using at that time, like uh, somebody I knew had a piano where you put in a, a floppy disk and it could play, you know, by itself. And then there was this, um, we went to a, a Seder, a Jewish Seder, somewhere in the, in, the, in the hills of San Jose. And he was showing us uh, some games he was creating on a, on a homemade computer. And, you know, it could have been Steve Jobs for all I know. <laughs> I don't remember who this was. But, you know, if, if I had stayed... Suppose I would have said at that time, I often thought about this, you know, I don't want to go back to New York. I don't want to go back to Columbia University. It's, I don't want to study biochemistry anymore. I want to do this. You know, I probably would have been rich by now. <laughs> so you never know. But, I, you know, I really uh, was amazed by all this and, uh, you know, felt that it was very uh, – Obviously, it's something I wanted to get involved with, and I did buy an Apple II computer, and I hung around. There was a club in, in New York City for Apple users, and there were some people there who had original Apple I computers with the signatures on the inside of the case of the team that made the computer. I don't know how much those are worth right now. Ah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> More than than anybody can afford, I guess. I mean, look look at eBay. Things are getting extremely yeah. expensive. 
So, you know, and a friend of mine, I think he he saved the Commodore 64 in its original box. He didn't even open it. He never opened it. <laughs> so, and the, the other thing I did, which was really interesting, too, was I, you know, was writing. Uh, I also wrote the manual for Operation Frog. Yeah. Yeah. Use this manual. Yeah. And uh, it's a nice screen. <laughs> Even the screenshots are in green, so I guess that all has to do with frogs, right? right. Frogs are green, so are the screenshots. So after that, I started doing more uh, manuals for different educational programs, and every edu every program was written on basically a different machine. It could have been the IBM Peanut or whatever. There, there are all, all these machines out there. So for me to write the program, I had to get the machine. They gave me a, a machine and the software. To, and so I got to use all these different uh, early model computers. I, I don't. I should have saved them. I would have, could have had a museum by now. I'm pretty sure people invite in invite you for that that you um that you actually had the chance to to um well get access on all these old computers. So so at that time I mean you couldn't go to the internet and learn how things are working. You <laughs> had to figure it out all yourself by paper manuals, handbooks and all that stuff. Yeah, there's no internet. You had to go. You had to go to the university. I went to Columbia to do the actual frog dissection and talk to an expert. And yeah, then I <laughs> did. I use textbooks. No, I got some of those mimeograph sheets that teachers used. I went to high school. I went to high school to get those. So it was a lot of research, but nothing on <laughs> nothing online. You had to go out into the real world and. Um, you know, find the things that you needed. Um, and I, you know, that's why I stayed with the sciences because I knew a lot of people in the sciences who can help me, you know, do some of these things. So I did ha also have a job doing high school um, after that when computers were now being used more in, in high school uh, for teaching. I did a lot of programs for a company that developed these um, things for the IBM, was it the peanut? What was after the peanut? No. The, Unfortunately, was, I, don't, I didn't know. <laughs> it was before the PC, the, you know, the PC, but um, they were developing for that, but the uh, same idea, but, you know, not as creative as Operation Frog. It was more like a biology book, you know, so you have images and text. And um, so, yeah, I did a lot of stuff with uh, <laughs> educational software. So the writing and the graphics, you know, were all part of it. And that's the kind of things I, I really like to do. I didn't like working in a laboratory that much because it's very uh, lonely. Uh, you're running reactions, you might have to stay late into the night or, you know, and everything, all this stuff was happening out there in the real world. So I think that's why I, I gave up science because it wasn't for me, you know, how I wanted to interact with what was going on in the world. And uh, that was an interesting time. <laughs> Did you actually um, focus and learn also about this stuff happening around uh, besides um, education programs, I mean, video games, computer games, arcades, I mean, the time uh, of Pac-Man and all that stuff, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, we we would play, um, you know, video games. Um, I wasn't into the gaming so much because, and I'm still not, you know, it's not something that... I guess I developed a habit for. Uh, I'm more interested in other ways of using computers. And one of the things I also got involved with was um, uh, the people who were developing um, on high-end computers. Uh, well, you know, they were more like mini computers. 
how to study the structure of biological materials. Um, and, you know, X-ray crystallographers, they're called, where they create now these three-dimensional models of proteins and DNA. You've seen that. Uh, and when I started that, you know, it was, that was very interesting. You, you didn't, it was, you know, probably the area where uh, required the most um, uh, sophistication and technology to create not only the graphics, but to rotate it and to uh, do scientific measurements with the images. It wasn't just to look at it. It was to actually research how this molecule might work. And uh, I got involved with a lot of the scientists who were doing that and on their machines. I never was programming any of that, but, you know, I worked with them and when I was building these models. And it was interesting to me, though, at that time, they had these great computer graphic images of, of the say, a protein, like hemoglobin, yet they wanted to build a model so they can walk around it, put their hands on it, look at it, and, you know, so I don't think, I don't know if they still do that now. Maybe it's so, it, you don't need the models anymore. And so I, I was in that business for a while. I probably got out at the right time. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you look at what happened 20 years ago in the 90s, where people said that there will be paperless offices, mm -hmm. and now we are printing more paper than ever because yeah. people like to touch things and see them vi uh, visually, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's One of the thing. interesting things, though, I guess, about gaming is when you can um, interact with people around the world in, in a video game. You know, I, I know my brother-in-law does that a lot. And uh, I think, you know, that's something that you can only do with computers, obviously. Mm. And um, I wish there were, I don't know if there were more useful let's say uh kinds of things where people do that um with computers and using game technology or computer graphics so we are as a topic that is raising again lately virtual yeah. reality yeah 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 and when i was with that um sales training department we were looking at virtual reality to do some things but I don't, it didn't really catch on at that time. So, uh, but we were looking at some pretty interesting technology. Uh, so, yeah. So what, what do you think is the reason that um, a lot of people in the late 70s and early 80s were scared of computers? And as we, as I mentioned earlier, were um, afraid that it would cost jobs. I mean, of course, automatism did did cost jobs because things were automated by computers, but it also created new jobs. Com for example, a graphic designers or programmers or something. So right. it's a kind of a shifting. And I guess in the 70s, I guess you were in your 30s, and you must have had a different approach because if you were if you were afraid of computers and how how it changed the world, you wouldn't have worked on Operation Frog. No, I mean, with uh, other people. You know, I was always in the the intellectual area. I never worked, you know, a lot with my hands and stuff that, or graphically even. I never worked. Well, I you know used to do oil painting and stuff like that. You can never put a real artist out of a job using a computer. I mean, you know, they're still, and and I think real artists would uh, like to use the computer to create art. Uh, so I wouldn't put them out of work. Um, it, it might enhance what they're doing. It, computers are not, you know, not creative. So for the creative industry, uh, I don't think people have to worry much but it's with the automated uh, processes uh, that, you know, really, it, 
it shouldn't be meant for people to do that stuff. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, I was just reading in the New Yorker magazine about, you know, paying people not to work because, you know, guaranteed income. So you're not putting people out of work. There's just no work that really people have to do. Yeah, eventually, if computers do everything, uh, I think that's an extreme, you know, view. But people are starting to talk about that. You know, um, what happens when people are put out of work by computers? You know, they just can't starve to death. Um, so there has to be um, Something else for people to do besides going to work every day. I mean, right now this topic, artificial intelligence is coming up again and um, cars that are driving by themselves. And then the ethical question in a car accident, who is going to survive or not? If there is a dead end in an accident and there has somebody to die, I think that's really very tricky questions well what was that what did you say like ask somebody to die i don't get that what do you mean i what? mean i mean for example if you if you are um, if you're driving an automatically driving car and there's a situation where where you can't well you can't make sure that everybody survives involved in the accident <laughs> and then the problem is how do you decide Oh. Who is going to die? How or does the who... car decide? Yeah, exactly. The car is in... Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> I mean, I mean, didn't you read those no, things? I haven't, I haven't read about that. No. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just a lot, lot logical consequence because if there are if there are multiple cars involved, and there always could be a situation where you have a dead end, or as I say, a devil cycle or a catch twenty two situation. Yeah, yeah. You know, I have thought about that lots of times when driving. You know, I say, what, what would happen if somebody is driving on the wrong side of the road and came after, came right at me? Should I go left and and hit him? And you know, maybe that would be better than me going right and hitting a tree and dying. You know, <laughs> what? Yeah, what would the car do if it was an automatic? <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just it's just um, in a way scary if you think about the problems created by computers, you know, or or for example, when this artificial intelligence by Facebook last year um, de developed an own language nobody could understand. They actually <laughs> put the plug on that one because the scientists were scared how oh, the program. I didn't hear about that. Maybe it's happening only in, in Europe, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, it's it's really some some things coming up, you know. And um, I mean, you have automatic translators or voice recognition, um, you know. That is interesting. That is a you know. Uh, my brother-in-law has he was he's a real computer programmer, and uh, what. He de his company developed is, you know, they would monitor phone calls and can transcribe the phone calls. You know, this is like for police departments and so on to use. Um, so I, you know, I said to him, you know, we could, we shouldn't, we should invent something. I mean, we, you, you know, I can help you design it and you can program it, you know, because so what I said, you know, I was going to go, I was going to Germany in a, in a few weeks when we had this conversation. I said, look, I have my iPhone. Uh, you know, you can go on your iPhone and it, you can get a translation and the iPhone actually can uh, do voice recognition and Why well, can't two people with two iPhones, you know, talk into their phone and it's automatically translated into the language to the other person in, with their iPhone? And I think they might even have some things like that right now. Well, so. Skype has an internal Skype translator, even for video calls. Oh, God, I'm not going to get into that. That's too much. <laughs> we'll have to try it out some other time. So I, I will talk in German and you would get the, you would get the translation into English. Uh, 
so uh, yeah, I actually tried studying German and uh, using a com you know computer. What was it? Um, uh, Rosetta Stone. You probably have that. Oh yeah, yeah. One of the they they have they have everywhere. Yeah. Their advertisements. Yeah. So I kind of enjoyed it. it to me, it's a challenge. You know. Uh, so the computer helped. Uh, and Rosetta Stone was just, just kind of fun, you know, but uh, it it takes a, it's a lot of work. <laughs> so I would like some kind of computer based game that would really uh, help me uh, learn a language. But I think really the only way you're going to do that is you're going to have to live in the country and only speak that language. Well, I, I don't live in the USA or Great Britain, but I still can speak. Yeah, I, I don't get it how the Europeans do it. I guess it's because of uh, early age. You know, you know, it really is. You probably were taught English very young. Well, well, I was born in 82, and actually I'm one of the last generations that didn't learn English at a young age. Um, not in kindergarten, not like what kids um, do nowadays. I just learned it at fifth class in primary school and oh, okay. um, then secondary school. So I, I never did any language studies. I just used it with people from abroad, you know? Yeah. Well, so, yeah. and yeah. Skype, it's uh, pretty simple. You know? I remember the first time I was in Germany taking the bus uh, from the airport. I saw a father and his young son, I guess was maybe five years old or something, he would switch from German to English yeah. with his son. And yeah. you know, at first I thought, well, are, these, are these Americans or are these people German, you know? And then I figured it out. You know, this is how they teach two different languages. And we don't, we, that's never done in this country. I mean, it's because you, we don't have different language people living so close together. And, you know, it's more homogeneous. Uh, you know, European countries are small, like the states in the U.S. And if we had, if Connecticut spoke a different language than New York, or if New Jersey spoke a different language than New York, I would know two languages, but I don't. <laughs> it, it doesn't work that way, so, Yeah. Well, basically, if you if you talk to an American who has never been to Germany, I'm always told, so how, how is it living in a country where you can drive from one end to another within two hours? And I'm like, no, Germany is not that small. You not are mistaken. Small. Yeah. Not that small. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you usually live within two hours of some other country. Yeah. I saw your comment on YouTube and I was like, wow, this guy is really into sharing details <laughs> about Operation Frog. I have to email him and I found you thanks to your um, politician homepage <laughs> where you actually wrote, I think, something like you want to bring the, the city closer to the people thanks to technology. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, still believe in communication and I think uh, technology computers are very key to communicating these days, obviously, especially younger people. Um, you know, I, I don't even want to answer my phone anymore, talk on my phone, you know, it's, uh, I think that's gonna, I might. My kids don't talk on the phone anymore. You want WhatsApp, Skype, you type, you don't talk, you type. Yeah, it's just text messaging. And <laughs> my wife is upset. Nobody calls me. I said, well, you get a text message. You know, you send them texts. <laughs> <laughs> Or go on Instagram. You know, <laughs> you, can't, you can't use the phone and call them. They don't want to be bothered. But, uh, yeah, I, I got into social media because of the... Um, work with the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, that was one, you know, so it was uh, a big, um, for me, uh, a good way to get ahead of everybody else that was uh, doing what I was kind of doing in the pharmaceutical industry, like writing a newsletter and 
you know, I, I was saying you just can't do a newsletter by email. Um, so I started doing um, social media and got very popular on Twitter. And had I saw that. Unfortunately, yeah. you stopped there. Yeah, I had 28,000 followers on Twitter, which, you know, was pretty good. And uh, so social social media was, I found to be very uh, useful, at least in the pharmaceutical industries for me. And so I'm trying to do similar things now that I'm in uh, local government. So I wonder, I mean, I mean, interestingly, we always think here in in Europe that Japan and USA are very modern countries. But your homepage made it look like those politicians really have to learn about how to use the internet and how to get closer to the younger generation. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a very skeptical person. I I think it's because in politics here and probably everywhere, uh, you know, they don't want too many people to get involved they you know this is how they stay in power but as a as a, a supervisor in a small town it's not you know i don't have an ambition to go to congress you know to, to some people might use this as a stepping stone to get somewhere else but i don't see why it has to be you know that way when you're in a small town and uh but there are lots of people who don't want to show people how things are done you know and reveal everything or be as transparent they try to keep things not so easy for people to find out um and i don't you know i don't like that idea i like using the technology to uh, get more information to people instead of, you know, them having to come to a meeting. These days, people are very busy. They just can't, you know, come to a meeting and they're not going to watch the meeting on TV either. I mean, they may remember to record it, but you got to have many different ways of reaching people. And so, you know, uh, social media, uh, email, uh, using apps that could run on the phone, uh, even websites, you know, blogs, those are, you have to try all of those in, in order to get to reach the most number of people. And so that's what I learned from the pharmaceutical industry. It's just not one channel. So you... Uh, Interesting. It was it was very good, and that's how I learned a lot about how to use social media. And was really that's another story about getting the pharmaceutical industry to use social media. We there was a group of us that were really into this. Again, mostly people who were interested in technology. They said, you know, the pharmaceutical industry should be doing more with social media in terms of marketing. We're talking about using it for marketing purposes. And uh, I think now it is, you know, but a few years ago when I started, it wasn't. So, again, I was able to be one of the first ones in there to do that. And uh, but, you know, after a while, I get bored because everybody is doing it. And so <laughs> but you're doing very good. Thanks for taking the time. All right. Enjoy you. your day. You too. <laughs> bye bye. bye.